Welcome to the Better Together podcast, where we look for ways that we can help each other to more effectively do ministry. Today we have with us Miss Krista Thornsberry. She graduated from Welch College with a Bachelor of Arts degree in English, and she also has a Master in Library and in Information Studies from the University of Alabama. Uh, she's a contributor. She's worked with the Hellas Society Forum in the past, and she is married to Frank Thornsberry, an English professor at Welch, and they both attend Emanuel Church in Gallatin, Tennessee. So well. Welcome, Miss Thornsberry. We're so glad that you're able to be here with us today. Thank you for having me. Well, I saw um, a seminar you had done, and we've also taken a, a look at some of the things you've written for the Hellas Society there. And we were especially interested in your work and, and some of the things you had written about complementarianism. Why don't you describe that for us? Sure. Um, so complementarianism is the view that we take on the roles of men and women, both in the church and in the home, and um, the idea that God has made us as different, though we're equal in worth, we have different roles to play in Excellent. His plan. So we're in the midst of, uh, there's a lot of tr trouble about these issues today, a lot of discussion, a lot of people say that Christians are behind, mm -hmm. uh, but it sounds like you're going back to like Genesis chapter 2 and and uh, maybe making that as a foundation for what you're saying. It sounded to me like you said that they're, you're different, but that does not have anything to do with worth. Both right. are important. So maybe unpack that for us a little bit there. Sure. So I think... Um, one of the major problems with modern feminism and the whole Christian feminist movement is a misunderstanding of what people mean by complementarianism. Mm -hmm. I think that they assume that if you say a woman can't be a pastor, mm -hmm. that you're saying she's actually not as good as men, so she shouldn't take that role. But I don't think at all that's what we're saying. I think that it's just another thing that God has ordained mm -hmm. and that— um, in that way, we're all called to submit. Men are called to submit to the plan God has for them, and mm -hmm. women are also called to submit to that plan. So biblical complementarianism is really saying men are a certain way, women are a certain way. It doesn't mean that men are better than women or women are better than men, but that they do have different functions, it sounds like I hear you saying, and they have different roles, and we even see that come out within the church. Yes. yes. So to unpack that with, as far as scripturally, uh, where, do we, where do we find some of that information? I know that uh, Paul writes about this, and mm -hmm. oftentimes opponents of complementarianism will point to Paul's writing where he says women should keep silent in the church, or women should cover their heads, or um, women should ask their husbands about things at home. Mm -hmm. And I think um, that that is painted to say that Paul's a misogynist, and uh -huh. that the Bible's behind the times, and that's only applying to... Um, to the church, the early church. And while, yes, I think we do have to understand that there is a cultural aspect to some of those commands, that Paul really isn't being misogynist. He's just saying um, that women serve God differently. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's also directly tied to his plan for the home. Mm -hmm. So if men are to be um, the servant leaders, mm -hmm. like we read in Ephesians, then it makes sense that in the church, which is the body of Christ and which is a family itself, that they would have that similar role. Mm -hmm. Very good. So they have different roles. They have different functions, different ways of leading. So let's talk about that a little bit. What are some of those differences that come out? Sure. Um, well, I think back to Ephesians, mm -hmm. um, Paul talks about to men specifically about loving their wives as Christ loved the church, which I think is a great responsibility for men and not something that I want to take away. That's actually um, loving someone so much that you're willing to die for them. Yes. It's a huge responsibility. Um, but I don't think that that means that a man is going to totally ignore his wife and her opinion, mm -hmm. that he's going to say, you have to submit to me and it doesn't matter what you think and it doesn't, um, it doesn't matter what your input might be. Mm -hmm. Instead, he's going to value her opinion and love her. Mm -hmm. That's true servant leadership. And I think, too, the idea of women being submissive, it's more of an attitude mm -hmm. than it is an action. Mm -hmm. It's more of being willing to be led. Mm -hmm. But in a good marriage, in a good Christian marriage, I don't think it's ever going to be burdensome for a woman to do that. I don't think, like I said, that a husband's ever going to demand 
perfect obeisance from her without yes. valuing her as um, as his he- helper. Yes, yes. And so uh, if um, a man is loving his wife as Christ loved the church, probably a lot of the issues of the whole submission question go away, don't they? Right, uh, yes. It probably just kind of flows um, a, a whole lot easier. Uh, and 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 would be different. Do you also sense, like in those commands, uh, women submit, and although just before that says submit to one another, and right, and then talks about uh, you men love your your uh, wife as Christ loved the church. Do you think he's kind of going at some of the weaknesses of, if you will, of men, and some of the uh, some of the things that women might especially want in yes. those passages? I think that that's absolutely the case. If you read Titus two, whenever mm-hmm. Paul's giving instructions for mentorship, yes, he gives the a list to men and a list to women, and in both of those lists, you see some things repeated, mm-hmm. but <laughs> other characteristics and other things that were to train younger women or younger men in are sex specific. Yes, and I think it does address particular vices that mm-hmm. each sex is given to. Um, I think, too, some commentators have written a lot about um, Eve and the curse and her desire will be toward her husband, actually meaning that her desire is to rule over her husband. Mm-hmm. So it makes sense then that we would have to be reminded mm-hmm. that we need to um, to turn from that sinful impulse that we mm-hmm. naturally have because of the fall. So I think um, that God is obviously very aware of who we are and where we struggle Mm -hmm. and so he's when he's writing his word and he's giving it to us right he's making sure he's addressing issues that we're particularly going to need help with yes so you mentioned the titus 2 passage which basically says uh hey men or older men teach the younger men this and these things specifically and older women teach the younger women this and these things specifically and Quite a bit of that is about roles and like even later in the passage, how men are to do their work and so forth, and uh, probably all goes in together. Um, it's, it's also interesting, like he tells, you go back, you talk a lot about the Ephesians 5 passage. He basically says, guys, if you love your bodies, you'll love your wife, doesn't he? Mm-hmm. So it's like he's saying, this is what's best for you personally uh, to Give your wife that kind of affection, that kind of love, that kind of sacrifice. And women, it's really good if you respect them and make them feel like they've, uh, you know, helped them to lead because they kind of they need that as well. You mentioned help, so like uh, you go back to the Genesis two, and um, so Eve is the helpmate of Adam, and uh, that has a lot to do with complementarianism as well, doesn't it? Yes. Let's talk about that a little bit. Sure. Um, well, I think one thing that we can learn from that passage right away is that women, uh, if, if this isn't say that we're worth something as women, I don't know what does, but the fact that Eve is Adam's gift. Yes. I mean, that's a profound, big truth, I think. Mm-hmm. And Adam obviously could not do all that God has signed him to do alone. He needed Eve. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So again, I think that speaks to worth and um, to the beauty of God's design. Um, I think a lot of the modern feminist movement tries to push this idea that women should do and ought to do, indeed, anything that men can do. Mm-hmm. Um and, and obviously, I think because God has designed us differently that that doesn't work. Um, and tr- quite frankly, I think there are things men can do that women just can't do because mm-hmm. we're not designed that way. On the other hand, I think there are plenty of things that women can do that right. men cannot do. Right. Um, here at the college, we do a Thursday night study with a lot of the girls on mm-hmm. campus. And we've read a lot of works by Nancy demoss Walgamuth and Mary Cassian, and um, I've familiar with Elizabeth Elliot and a lot of these women um, often advocate the idea that um, God made us different as men and women because we were we reflect different aspects of his glory Mm -hmm. so I as a woman reflect God in a different way different characteristics of him that you as a man don't Mm -hmm. and you reflect characteristics of God that I as a woman don't Mm -hmm. and we need both of both genders to give a full reflection of the glory of God very good 
Very good. So it's not complete, really. Right. The Lord meant for them to be complete. Right. And uh, you go back to the passage, and none of the animals worked. And then the Lord says, you know, it's just not good. It's not good that man should be alone. And uh, and then we have the creation of woman. So um, let's think about that a little bit. How is it that men and women actually do complete or help each other? Uh, you go back to that Genesis 2 passage, it's really getting down to work, the work they were doing there in the Garden of Eden. How is it they help each other to do their work better? Well, I think a lot of it has to do with temperament. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. Mm -hmm. um, men are, they tend to have more of a leadership, more of an assertive kind of personality yes women on the other hand tend to be more nurturing mm -hmm. and more um concerned with caring for others yes. and that's not of course not to say that there aren't caring men and there aren't women who you know in other roles in society perhaps have leadership positions yes i don't think that that's unbiblical but i do think that by and large there are characteristics that women have um and that men have mm -hmm. that help each other that we couldn't have one without the other. You even hear the idea of um, marriage helping to civilize men, so yes. to speak, because yes. of the more gentle nature of a woman's spirit, and also the fact that the man wants to care for the woman and protect her. Mm -hmm. So that has a great effect on him, that without both genders, and I think we see this a lot in um, the aftermath we're facing of the sexual revolution and mm -hmm. um, the havoc that that's just wreaked on society, that people don't even know how to how to deal with yeah it. they don't know how to deal with their own differences they don't we're left with a society of confused mm -hmm. chaotic people mm -hmm. peace is gone um so i think and i think a lot of that can be traced back to our denial of this very basic calling of each of us to be a man or to be a woman and we're paying dearly for it aren't oh, we? oh yes so wilcox you probably aware of has written a lot about how it's believed that uh, women help domesticate domesticate right. men and help them to have jobs and so forth and uh and there's a lot of researchers that talk about how it's one of the best uh ways to fight poverty is to have good marriages so sounds like that's you see that in the scripture, but you can even see it in some of the sociological research. And uh, I'm sometimes struck with um, Ben Franklin, not the best married fellow, but yeah. how there's a quote out there where he said, you know, the best thing for a man is to have a good, solid, you know, a woman that would help him and said, it's, without her, it's like only having one set of scissors. You know? mm -hmm. So yeah. you, it goes all the way back to Genesis 2. So is there anything else, you know, we need to think of a lot of, um, you know, men and women will get this podcast and listen, but also a lot of ministry leaders. So uh, and, and a lot of parents as they're trying to teach their children about um, gender roles and so forth. So uh, how can we convey to folks really the biblical approach that really is quite different than what they hear out there in the world today. Right. Um, I think one of the great dangers and one of the traps we've fallen into is a, the trap of assumption. Mm -hmm. So we assume things about um, the world's position on women. Mm -hmm. We assume that feminism if you haven't given this much thought, that feminism just means that women were given the right to vote and that mm -hmm. women are able to be employed just as men were. And I think that's a dangerous assumption, especially mm -hmm. if you kind of trace the waves of feminism and maybe some of the early aims weren't were noble. Yes. But I think eventually the movement was co-opted by people who were um, just totally rejecting not only gender roles, but ultimately rejecting God and rejecting mm -hmm. the idea of um, civilization as we've known it for thousands of years. So I think we can't assume that we actually understand feminism if we mm -hmm. don't really kind of study it. Uh -huh. I also think we can't assume that we understand biblical, um, the biblical mandate based on um, some older versions of complement, maybe not even a complementarianism. I think you might call it Christian patriarchy, where perhaps in the church as kind of a reaction against feminism that maybe sometimes people went too far. Yeah. And whether they consciously believed it or not, women were treated as second class citizens. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I certainly don't think that that's scriptural. Mm -hmm. um, 
I think so. I think we've got to kind of clear ourselves of assumptions. Yes. And inform ourselves. Okay. Not only of what the Bible says. Obviously, that's the most important thing. But I do think you've got to be familiar with what, especially our girls are hearing. Mm-hmm. They're hearing so many conflicting messages, and this is something that I think makes it quote unquote hard to be a woman now. Because yeah. on one hand, you're told you're told you're empowered and you can do anything and. Uh, you should do anything. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, they say you're oppressed. The uh-huh. men are out to get you. Um, you can't really make it unless somebody gives you a special hand up because you're a woman. And that's confusing and that's distressing, mm-hmm. I think, to girls and not helpful. And um, I think also the world's vision promises power and pleasure, mm-hmm. and those are very enticing. Mm-hmm. So if in the ministry or in our homes, we don't carefully and intentionally share God's vision Mm -hmm. for manhood and for womanhood, then our children will look to the world or will look to others that they see and they'll adopt that view because like all sin, it's enticing and it can be pleasurable for a season, but ultimately the end is destruction. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important that we have these intentional conversations, that we are careful to model these behaviors in our marriages and in Mm -hmm. our churches. Um, and I think it's important for pastors, too, to take advantage of y- the gifts of the women in their church, to use them, to use women. Yes. I, just because we don't think women can be pastors, it doesn't mean we don't think women have a role to play in the church. Right, right. I mean, if it weren't for Sunday school teachers of children, for who knows where many of us would be because of the godly training that we receive mm-hmm. from these women early on. So I think that that's an important thing, to value the women in your church and um, use them appropriately. Okay, so that's really a way of going on offense, isn't it? Yes. Is to uh, be your women are involved, your women are doing things, and uh, it's it's seen, it's understood that this is important work, and we're also probably explaining that to folks as well. Like uh, this is you know these, this is how these roles work, and this is what the scripture says, and this is why we're doing it in this particular way. Yeah. So modeling it, getting them very involved. Probably needs to be a lot of good teaching on Genesis 1 and right. 2 and mm-hmm. Ephesians 5 and uh, the Colossians passage and Titus 2 and and trying to trying to really put those um, put those before people in their minds and then pe- get people very active thinking about those issues as well. But I think what I hear you saying is we better get on offense because uh, right now we're on defense and mm-hmm. you can't really be silent about this because right, no. uh, they're, then they're just hearing one side. Right. Yes. And so what I hear you saying is get them involved. Uh, we really need to teach and, uh, and then it does take you back to Titus chapter 2 where uh, older folks are modeling and showing and, and we're demonstrating it there in the church. Well, that's that's very helpful to us. Now, let's think about parents. Okay. So what can parents do? And, you know, I know this is kind of um, looking down the road probably for you, but you're here, you're seeing young people all the time, and um, you're thinking, what do parents need to be teaching their little girls especially, but even little boys, uh, about some of these issues? Well, I think, uh, again, it goes back first to modeling Mm -hmm. as much as you can. I understand that there are times when perhaps a woman is raising her children alone Mm -hmm. because of whatever the circumstance. Um, At the same time, though, I think that the woman can still share, can still explain biblical principles, can find other men mm-hmm. to um, speak into the life, especially of her son, if mm-hmm. um, if she's by herself. But um, I think all parents need to be intentional, mm-hmm. as we've already said, um, and they need to consider what the culture is saying. And I think too, got to be careful not to enforce. Um, the really awful gender stereotypes that the that yes. the culture has. So we live in a very cognitively dissonant culture. Mm-hmm. On one hand, you have this whole notion that gender is fluid and it doesn't matter. But then whenever you get down to it, there's either this super macho masculinity yeah. and almost hypersexualized femininity. And yeah. if you fall into those stereotypes and enforce those as true femininity and true masculinity then i think you could do great damage Mm -hmm. to your child um i think you do have to know your child individually Mm -hmm. let's say for example you have a son who is um 
maybe he's less inclined to go outside and play, but maybe he's very intellectually gifted. That's yes. not at all. You shouldn't at all assume that he's not a masculine boy. Right. It's just a different kind of masculinity. Right. So I think knowing your own child is important. And w- within that, mm-hmm. pointing them to the biblical model, sharing for the, with them God's design for the family and um, going all the way back to Genesis. And that yeah. just kind of, I think we have to be more intentional about it than we used to right? because there is so much confusion and there's so many messages that, I mean, invade your home on the smartphone level every right. day. So. so some of the ideas about masculinity and femininity have nothing to do with the Bible. Right, that's and right. So you can, you can be, you know, for example, David was a harp player and how many right. male harp players do you see these days? Right. And uh, Deborah was apparently pretty tough. You right. Know? So you see... You see those examples, and sometimes that's why people do have some gender identity issues right. is because a different type of uh, masculinity or femininity was was pushed upon them. So you're saying, no, no, let's not listen so much to the culture, whatever the culture may right. be. Let's go back to the scriptures, and, and let's really think about that uh, and instructing our kids and then. There are a lot of folks in uh, single parent situations that does take us back to Titus chapter Mm 2, doesn't it, where you use other people within the church. Mm -hmm. And there may be people listening to us that don't have children or grandchildren, but you can be those models there within your church. And it's important that you step up and and, uh, be willing to do that as well. Yeah. Well, we thank you so much, Miss Krista, for stopping by to see us today. Thank you for your good work and your writing, the information you have out there. And we just wish you well and uh, Godspeed as you continue your work. Thank you.